Hi, Nick. Hey, good afternoon. All right, I think we're going to get started. Um, first, I want to welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, for those of you that I don't know, my name is Nick Tui. I lead the marketing efforts here at Emercore. Uh, today, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Thomas Gaspar and Dr. Uh, Stefan Ulbrich from the Dresden Heart Center. Um, that's who you see on your screen there. Um, and on behalf of Emercore and, and the Dresden Heart Center, I really want to thank you guys for joining. Uh, we know everyone's really busy and facing really unique demands during this challenging time. Uh, what we wanted to do was to offer a small break from those demands just to talk about what we all would prefer to be doing right now. Um, so, and, and I hope that this is uh, informative and uh, again, a little bit of a break from uh, what we've all been facing. So with that, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Gasper and Albrecht for, uh, for sharing their experiences on the future of uh, catheter ablation uh, with us today. Um, the presentation should last about 20 minutes or so, and afterwards we'll host a, a short Q&A session where uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, and then we'll wrap it up. So um, with that, um, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Drs. Gasper and Ulbrich. Gentlemen. Okay, Nick, thank you very much for the kind words in the beginning. Hello again to all of you from here from Dresden. Uh, here's Stefan. Ulrich and Thomas Gaspar, and I have the opportunity to share with you our first experience with MR guided ablations. Um, just open the presentation. So I hope you, you get my, my screen. So the topic of my lecture today, future of cardiac ablation. And um, that's a complete new field. I think we are starting with a new era of treatment of cardiac arrhythmia. And before we start, the question is, do we really need this new, tech, new challenging technology? And therefore, the first question, what are the advantages of MR-guided ablation? The most reasonable point is fluoroscopy. We try to avoid fluoroscopy because all of us know that fluoroscopy can, can harm the patients, the staff and the doctors. So we try to work in the future without fluoroscopy, but it's not the most, the biggest advantage of MRI. The biggest advantage of MRI is dimensional real-time visualization of cardiac anatomy together with functional information in the tissue. We can to try to visualize Arrhythmia substrate, scar fibrosis. We can look about neighborhood, neighboring structures. And in the future, we want to go for description of lesion formation, of gap formation. This point is not addressed in the right way up to date. It's still research. So we try to go for detection of scars with tissue changes, direct tissue changes, visualization with maybe mid MR thermo thermometry, but all of these points are for the future and then it's still on the research topic. And last of not, but not least, a big advantage of MRI that you can immediately detect complications, for example, tamponade pericardial effusions, and you can detect it immediately without a secondary image modality like echocardiography. Um, where are we today? Today we are still dependent on fluoroscopy. This is a case we performed several weeks ago. It was an, I think, 80-year-old male patient. He was admitted to our hospital due to ventricular tachycardia. And as you see in the fluoroscopy, this is several ill patients. He has two, uh, two, uh, two uh, protestic valves. We have uh, impressive aneurysma of the left ventricle due to ischemic cardiomyopathy. However, these are impressive images, but there was need for fluoroscopy, and we don't have 3D anatomical information. We then don't have functional information, and we don't know where is the scar, where is the substrate, and what to do. Um, I think this ECG is the easiest ECG for all fellows, for all the physicians, because it's obviously a typical flutter. And that's where we start with MR guided ablations, because we really, we know really good the uh, pathophysiology behind the flutter. So we know the flutter, it's on the, depend on the right isthmus, so it's circle in the right atrium, and we treat flutter since many decades, fluoroscopy guided. It's a, the first moment, simple procedure, just go to the isthmus, 
and a blade a line in the area to terminate the flutter. However, even flutter ablation could be challenging because fluoroscopy didn't give us the information what we sometimes need. As you see in the right side of the slide, there are some patients with some pouches on the right isthmus. And these are the cases when you go for the isthmus ablation, a straightforward procedure, and you take a long, long time until you can block the isthmus and nobody knows what happens. You try to use steerable sheets and, and try to do everything, but in the end, it's just because of the pouch on the, in this area. So that's, a, I think, a nice example how MRI can help us to, to, to know the anatomy, to know the cardiac structures. Um, a com and another point is this description of fibrosis, because in the most case of arrhythmia, we know that disease myocardium, fibrosis, scar, are the source of the arrhythmias. And there are upcoming studies that now we focus more and more on substrate-based ablation. As you see in the left part of the image, this is a procedure we performed several weeks ago in our center. It was an endo-epicardial atrial fibrillation ablation. And we try to visualize the atrial substrate, the endocardial substrate and epicardial substrate. However, it's a challenging and long-lasting procedure. Therefore, it would be helpful to get easy and a quick information about the, the, the disease in the atrium. And I think all of you know the data from Marouche from the Utah group about MRI description of atrial fibrosis. You know the different Utah categories, one to four. And there are several studies which address this point. For example, the, the DCAF-2 study, which tries to treat these areas. I'm curious about the outcome of this study. However, I'm looking forward. I think that it's a good point to go in. And nowadays, limitations nowadays, we have to perform the MRI before the ablation to look for substrate, and then we decide how to ablate. At one point, if we can go with one procedure to combine MRI with interventional procedures within the MRI, we can visualize the substrate at the same time and tweak the substrate in one workflow. Another point are ventricular arrhythmias. I think all of you are familiar with this. Um, our main goal is to visualize low voltage areas in the left ventricle as a source of the arrhythmia and treat them. However, since more than 10 years, we know that the electrical changes are not fits or not always fits to the morphological changes or the histological changes in MRI. So this is a, this is a publication from Cordoneur and colleagues, and they saw that the low voltage areas during the 3D mapping procedure, electrical map procedure, did not perfectly match to the MRI, uh, to, the, to, the lower, to the scar, which was shown in the MRI. And that's again a good example. It would be helpful to get this information, this anatomical information and this structural information during the procedures, not only pre-procedural or not only relied on the voltage maps. Um, so I think it's reasonable that it was a good point to try to move with the EP studies in the EP lab or the MRI. And we tried to do this, I think, more than 10 years ago. These are, these are the first images. It was my time in, in the Heart Center of Leipzig. It was one of, one, one of the first MRI-guided procedures. So we start with animal studies, then we go for humans. And as you see, it was really a challenging situation. You see a lot of wires, really a lot of screens. It was so, in the end, I'm happy that it's 10 years ago because it was, it was horrible. We have long wires everywhere. We have long flash, flashing lines. So it was a long way to go. Now, 10 years after, we are here. This is our uh, interventional MRI suite. You can see it's a clear, it's, now it looks more like a hospital. So it looks like a clear, sterile um, area. So we have inner monitors, we have patient monitors. Um, you see in the right lower panel, the, the, out, the area where Stefan is sitting and looking for the MRI, for the, for, the, for the navigation, for the irrigation. So I think we made big changes. 
in our center MRI graduate procedures now are the are clinical routine. So we go as a clinical routine for right-sided ablation procedures. In the next slides, I would like to share with you our workflow, how we do this. Um, one difficult point in the past was that we have to separate the procedure in the first part when we make a groin puncture, we bring the catheters into the heart, and then we move the patients from the EP lab to the MRI suite. Nowadays, we do the whole procedure within the MRI suite. So as you see in the left top, the nurse are preparing the patients with ECG electrodes, with monitoring. So the patient prepared in the front of the MRI scan. You see a ECG with a heart rate of 145, the patients are flutter. You see a uh, saturation of 93. Um, so the most part of the procedure is in the front of the scanner. Then we transfer the patient just in the scanner room. These are only three meters and continue the preparation in the scanner room. You can see our head nurse, Sandra, who delineate the patient the right way. And then we move to the scanner with the whole team. Sorry for the, for the, you can see, the nurse has now prepared a table for the groin puncture for the excess in the scanner. So you see a different wires, you see the puncture, the sheath, the loop anesthesia. So everything is prepared in the MRI scanner room. Then the patient will be covered with a sterile wrap. And after 15 minutes, the patient is ready for the procedure. Then it's my part. I go for the groin puncture and it's completely new that we perform the whole procedure within the scanner. You can see how I puncture the right femoral ring. I introduce the sheath over a wire, it's a terumo wire, so then I will get a catheter. I, the patient will transfer into the hole. Then I use again a digital cover to get to, to have a sterile area. I always have two gloves. One glove and one glo glove. Um, I advance the catheter only a couple of centimeters to the, to the sheet, to the groins. And then it's a point when Stefan is asked to start the scanning protocols. So the first step is to introduce the catheter to the femoral veins, to the pelvic veins. This could be challenging, and that's uh, that's why we, in, in the past we always do this in the EP lab. But now we have the so-called active catheter imaging, so we can follow the catheters within the MRI scan, as you see here. So I bring the catheter from the left groin, the left femoral vein, and introduce the catheter in the vena cava inferior. And as you see in the beginning, I ended up in the side range. And I, as Stefan saw this immediately, and I bring a catheter back, turn a little bit around. And it was really simple to advance the catheter, the infravena cava, and to the heart. So it was, in all our cases, it was quite simple to cross the pelvic vein to go to the direct to the heart. Um, then we start the scanning sequences. The, in the left panel, you can see the, the monitor from outside, with the, the Siemens monitor. and Stefan try to give me the right panels. And that was one limitation in the past because we always worked with a uh, radiologist. They are really nice guys, but the radiology have a different view to the procedure than the cardiology. So we are used to work in the LAO in the RIO projection. And that, was, uh, that needs some time and until uh, we can educate them that we want to have an RIO and LAO projection. However, Stefan is a cardiologist. And so he immediately knows what we want. And you can see here how the catheters are in the heart. I stopped it shortly. 
you can see an LIO projection. You can see one catheter in the coronary sinus, and the second catheter in the area of the isthmus. Then Stefan switched to the aureo projection. You can see again the ablation catheter in the area of the right isthmus. And this patient was special because this patient had a pouch in the area of the isthmus, as you can see here. And therefore, I have to bend the catheter. You can follow the catheter nicely how I bend it and go perpendicular to the area. It's again an additional important information to the 3D scan sequences. On the right lower button, you can see the, the short movie how I see the whole procedure. And I'm standing in the scanner. I have the two monitors in front of me, one monitor for the EP system for MRECOR, the second monitor for the MRI images, and these are all straight forward. Where we are now, we start this uh, experience in the end of January, and we, we treat until now 10 patients. The first patient was a patient with uh, an arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and we used this procedure first for, 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 for evaluation of, of the risk, risk stratification. So we perform a ventricular stimulation MRI and we perform an MR scan to look about the, the anatomy and about the, the scar or the, the right ventricle. The following eight patients were patients with a typical flutter. And even that there are really complete new procedures for the whole team that was straightforward. So we need for the CS intubation only 8.5 minutes. The RF ablation duration was 20 minutes and the whole procedure was in the mean 43 minutes. So as you see, it was not longer than we uh, normally uh, need in the conventional EP lab. The last patient was a patient with an AV nodal ablation. So the patient was suffering for atrial fibrillation. She had already on a CRT pacemaker inside. And due to refractory treatment, we go for an AV node ablation. And also, this, uh, this ablation with an MRI was a straightforward procedure. All the pre uh, procedures uh, was performed without adverse events. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to conclude the following. Potential advantages of MRI intervention procedures are the combination of anatomical, functional, and substrate information. It was first time that we can use a uh, MR only workflow. So the complete intervention for the groin puncture to the ablation was within the MRI room. It was feasible, safe, and it was really fast implementable as a clinical routine procedure. The active catheter imaging, as you nicely saw when I crossed the groin veins, when I saw the catheters in the heart, allows successful right atrial ablations. Last but not least, Still, if you want to go to a wilder clinical application, for example, left sided procedure like D and atrial fibrillation relations, we require perfectly ECGs, number of catheters, layers, steerable sheaths, needles, and other interventional tools. However, to my knowledge, on all of these points, the colleagues are working, so I think we are on the right way to go for more complex procedures. Thank you very much. All right, Thomas, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, can you hear me? I can, yeah, great. So first, thanks so much for uh, uh, for walking through that. Um, it's been really a, 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 nice, uh, a nice time working with you. Um, now I think we wanna to transition to the uh, question and answer portion of, uh, of the presentation. Um, for those of you that are online, the easiest way to, uh, to let us know that you have a question is to hit your participant button in the uh, on the bottom of your screen, and then on the far right hand side, there will be a a, a hand um, in the uh, participant uh, panel that you can uh, you can hit to raise your hand if you have a question. And then uh, Karen, who's on the line from our from our team, will uh, will unmute you and uh, and allow you to ask a question. So, um, does that, does anyone have any questions? I know we have one or two that came in um, on the uh, the private Q and A that we can we can go to first. Um, while uh, while we compile the people that have uh, have questions, um, and maybe that's where we're, where we'll uh, where we'll start. So, 
Thomas, one of the things that uh, um, I know that people have questions about are, are the indications. So right now we're indicated for atrial flutter. Um, can you kind of maybe talk about um, your journey and, and, and why it's so important to maybe to, be, to, begin, uh, to begin that journey now? Uh, Nick, do you hear me? Yep, I can. So thank you very much for this really important, interesting question. So um, I think to start, it, why we do flat ablation, I think that was a right point to start intervention MRI procedures because atrial flutter in most of cases are straightforward procedure. However, it's clear that, that the development for intervention MRI procedures wasn't made for flutter. I think it's clear that we have to go for more complex procedures. But I do not think that we that the colleagues should wait until we are able to do left side procedures because all the workflow, all the all the all the all the colleagues, all the nurses, the doctors have to go familiar with these procedures. Right? That's why I think to start with flutter is the right way to go in. One important point is it's clear that you cannot bind an MRI interventional scanner just for go for flutter ablations. You don't have so many patients with flutter that they do work the whole day only with flutter. In our center, we, we equipped the MRI scanner two years ago and we start ablations eight weeks ago. In the first two years, we used the scanner as a routine scanner for, for a lot of different cardiac procedure like ischemia diagnostic, like substrate visualization, like all of this stuff. So if you start now, you don't need an MRI scanner just for ablation. You can use a scanner also for a lot of other cardiac procedure. And I, I would like uh, to ask Stefan, Stefan, how many procedures we perform per year in this scanner? I think we perform about 1,500 procedures, about 400 um, ischemia tests, and we are really uh, we have a lot of patients with implantable devices. So we perform scanning in about 300 or 400, yeah, 300 patients a year with implantable devices. So in the end, at this point, I would say we use the MRI scanner 90 percent for diagnostic procedures it can have a value for the hospital. And nowadays we use only 10% for ablation procedures. I think in the future we will change these numbers. I will. I think we will go more and more ablation, but today we use it more for diagnostic or less for ablation procedures. Great, and, and I like the point that you made earlier too about just reducing, reducing exposure to, to radiation, not having to wear lead, things like that. Those are also, I think, pretty helpful. Um, we did have one question. That, that, just one point. Oh, um, I would like to avoid that. Uh, to go through the point that we use MRI for radiation exposure, or exposure to avoid them because that's not the main point. There are still techniques on market when you can use with low radiation exposures for the whole procedure. That's not the main advantage of MRI. So the the, the, the advantages of MRI are much different than only ex, uh, radiation exposure. Sure. Uh, we did have a couple other questions that came in on the Q&A. Professor Vernoy from Maastricht, hello. Um, he's asking, um, how do you confirm block in atrial flutter? Do you use any EAM, EAM software in the CMR? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, and that's for sure. We are electrophysiologists, so we don't go to just MRI and burn, some, burn somewhere and say we are, we, are, we, are, we are ready. So we have clear electro anatomical physiological endpoint. So we have two catheters in the MRI and we measure the conduction times over the isthmus. So in the end, it's, it's, it's already an EP lab what we have there. We have intracardiac signals. It's, it doesn't differ so much from the conventional procedure in the EP lab. Great. Um, another question. Um, hello, Dr. Gaspar, you told us that the procedure time is about the same as the normal procedure time with the first cases. What do you think a best practice procedure time could be, needle to closure? Um, the, the first point, I was really surprised about the procedure times in the MRI scanner. 
As Dr. Piokowski and the guys from Emerico comes, comes to me and say, oh, now we can start to do ablation MRI scanner. I expect procedure times for, for more than two hours because I have the experience 10 years ago when the start is can sequences and ablations. And now, even after eight ablation patients, we have the same procedure time like in a conventional EB lab. So I'm really surprised. And I think there are different points. One important point is the anatomical visualization. So from, from these eight patients, we had at least two patients with a big pouch. And I know these patients in the EP lab. If the patient has a pouch, you start to ablate, you use different sheets, durable sheets, just to get rid of them. And you are not really aware that there's a pouch. But in the MRI scanner, it was after a couple of minutes, obviously, that there's a pouch and they have to add, add no high go there. I think they, I just can add the procedure time is a bit longer because of a post-procedural post CMR scan just to visualize edema or microvascular obstruction. But it's, I think it's not really needed if you have a clear electrophysiological Endpoint. Yeah, and, and in the end, all these measurement, post procedural measurements are more from scientific information and in, in, in interest because we want to see the edema, we want to see what we perform in MRI because these are the first cases in, in Germany, maybe worldwide. And so we have to have some scientific interest and you don't have to do this, but I think it's worthful to get this information. Great. Uh, next question, another one from the uh, master team. Did you did you miss not having an electroanatomical mapping system software? Um, not at this point. If I should be honest, not at this point because um, we have two impo important tools. One is this active catheter imaging. So with active catheter imaging, um, you are really it's really nice to see how the catheter is. Yeah? And uh, the Siemens software is also really helpful because we have this typical orientations in RIO and LIO. In the newest software version, you have this in the same time. So you have both projection at the same time, like a biplane fluoroscopy system. And I, I, I do not think that we really need this 3D mapping systems for, for right atrial procedure at this point. When we move to the left side, when we move to more complex arrhythmias, then then for sure it would be worthful and helpful to have this, but not at this point. Uh, great. Um, next question: What kind of MRI? What type of MRI images are acquired during the procedure? So that might be for Stefan. Yeah, that's a perfect point, Stefan. Please. <laughs> so, I, if I am, uh, if I take the question, I. We are using SSFP sequence, interactive real-time sequences. So that's the question. And um, of course, in the patient with the implanted um, CATP system, we had to switch to a gradient IQ sequence. But it's really sequence. Of course, SSFP is faster, but with small adjustments, you also can use gradient angles. Yeah. And, and one point from my side, that's all was very impressive to me because when we started these first procedures, we were sitting only one afternoon to find the right sequences, the right site thicknesses, and the, the colleagues were so fast to find the, the, the right, uh, right sequences to do this. It, it was incredible. We, we, you can, it's really, our advice is to adjust the life sickness in order to, to get the um, real position or the best position. So at first we took a big slice thickness, about 40 or 50 millimeters, and then we switched to 10 millimeters to increase the image quality. Great. I think this dovetails right nicely into the next question, which would be, um, we got some requests to share your workflow, and I, and I would imagine um, for the uh, for the folks that will be operating the uh, the scanner during the procedure, I think that type of information would be really helpful. So it would be really nice to share the workflow in detail to speed up the learning curve uh, from our side. Could you share yeah. that? Is there is there a learning or knowledge structure in place already? So. I would say that there's not a structure per se, certainly um, as part of the installation in Recor and uh, people like Stefan and, and Thomas will be available to help 
with the with the training. Um, but nonetheless, I think it'd be really helpful, uh, Thomas, to, to push out some type of either best practices white paper or something on on, uh, on workflow. I think we're going to get a lot of questions about that moving forward. Yeah, you are completely right, Nick. And one important point from my side. All of the colleagues who want to come over to Dresden to see procedures are always welcome. We do, we actually, we stopped the produce procedures because of the COVID situation, Corona situation, but I hope that we can start really soon to go on with these procedures. I expect to do at least three to four flutter ablations per week. And if some colleague out there have some interest to join us, you are always welcome. That's great. Um, next question. Um, do you expect to save on workflow uh, pre-procedural imaging like echo and CT compared to a conventional procedure? Um, this is a perfect question, and I really thank for this question because um, that, that covers two topics. One topic is how we use MRI today. And as I said before, we use 90% of the time the MRI just for diagnostics. So, but we use it very, very often. And there are already many patients where I go direct for the MRI, not for the echo. For example, we, we always use 3D anatomy like CT in the past for AFib ablation. At the time when we get the MRI scan in the house, we stopped CTs and we do all these patients MRI, MRI scans for the atrium. And for the future, I'm absolutely sure that you can save a lot of pre-procedural imaging when you do these procedures within the MRI. All right. Um, another good question. Um, are there any special hygiene requirements? So and I, I, I would add from my side, maybe even touch on the safety protocols that you guys have, in, have instituted in Dresden in terms of uh, the change from moving from an EP lab to an ICMR. Um, if I, if I get the, the question right, you are asking about some uh, safety protocols if you have some complications, right? Yeah, as well as hygiene. I mean, you touched on it a bit in your presentation with the draping and the multiple gloves, but I think both, you could probably do both. And it's important to, to educate the whole staff. When we discuss about complications with an MRI scanner, there are two major complications you have to handle them. One complication is if you have an AV block and you have to stimulate. So for that issue, we are always ready to stimulate to the Imrico catheters, which are already inside of the body. So if you have an AV block, we can stimulate in the MRI scanner, and then we can bring the patient fast out, and we can stimulate outside of the scanner with external stimulation. And the second um, complication would be, we have to be worried, is about the tamponade, the pericardial effusion. And for that point, actually, if we do some MRI scans, ablation MRI, we always have an EP lab ready to manage these complications. However, I'm not sure that we need this for the future. I think that's just a question of practice. And um, the advantage of MRI, you can see really fast if you have some complications. I think you have to train. And I think in the near future, we are ready to make also the, the punctures for epigradial effusion within the MRI scanner. What we can do is echo-guided in the front of the MRI scanner. All right, great. <clears throat> Another question, did you take advantage of MRI to visualize the lesion after ablation? So I think that's a question of, for Stefan. <laughs> yes, of course. We, <laughs> we per performed uh, post-procedural scans, and we did uh, T2 imaging. Um, and of course, I think this uh, is related to the next questions. We performed uh, late gadolinium enhancement images, and of course, also, also early enhancement images are short about uh, three minutes after contrast agent and the late, late gut usually after 10 minutes. And um, the the problem is, of course, the sedated patient. So these sequences must be free breathing images. So we use 3D navigator gated images. And we, we were able to perform this in, 
in seven of eight patients. In one patient, the ejection fraction was very low and we don't want him to be longer, to stay longer in the scanner, but it's really possible. And we found T2 elevated tissue. So we are sure that we perform a created lesions that we see by CMR imaging. Great. Um, I think maybe last question here. Um, I think I know the answer, but Thomas, I'll, I'll let you answer. So since you've implemented um, the Immercar system uh, in Dresden, how many atrial flutter cases were done in your conventional EP lab um, while you did the 10 cases in MR? Have you moved completely over to uh, the, um, the uh, ICMR? <laughs> That's a good question. So when we was thinking about to go for MRI ablation, I was thought that one case per month in the MRI, the other cases will be do all on the commercial AP lab. But after the first two cases, it was so straightforward and so simple and so impressive that I decided to do all the flutter ablations within the MRI scanner. So since the, I think it was the first week of February, we do all the flutter ablations in the MRI scanner. That's great. All right, so I think that those are all, uh, I think those are all the questions we, we received. Um, I wanna thank everyone on the line for taking your time uh, to, uh, to log in and to learn a little bit more about what we're doing and, and see all the great work that, that's happening in Dresden. Um, we can't wait to get to work with you guys. I know many of you, um, Greg and the team have, have worked very closely with uh, up until now. And we're just waiting for uh, for things to, uh, to to return to normal a bit, um, and we'll be uh, right. Uh, we'll be able to visit you guys again and and move forward uh, beyond just the uh, the uh, talks like this and and, and and everything else. So I wanted to also thank uh, Thomas and uh, and Stefan for uh, for their time, their effort. They put a lot of work into this, um, and uh, it's been really great working with you. And just wanted to thank you for your time. So. Um, with that, um, please let us know um, how you, uh, we'll, we'll send out a survey afterwards um, on how, uh, how well that this was received and if you'd like to see more of uh, these types of uh, programs from Embracore. But uh, just want to say thank you again, stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, we'll be uh, in touch soon. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Take care, everyone. See you forward to see you. Bye-bye.